See, I was born in the Ice Age at a time when these guys were all really popular. And the best thing we had in terms of technology was this, an old school Mac. And the biggest concern I had with technology was making it through the Oregon Trail without dying of dysentery. And newsflash, I always died of dysentery. In fact, even when I moved up to Oregon, now where I live, I was a little disappointed to see that nobody around here seemed to have dysentery at all, which is kind of a bummer. And then what happened is I reached the eighth grade. And this was the year that our school got the internet. But this isn't about the internet. And it's not about the technology. This is what you see over and over and over again. See, the innovation was something very different. It was something deeply human. It was something that we all want for our students. And I'll get into it in just a second. When I was in middle school, in eighth, eighth grade, I was the combination of incredibly nerdy and incredibly shy. In fact, I still remember that I had one friend, and this one friend, his name was Matt. Uh, we would hang out together. We were two nerds in a pod. And I loved you know, hanging out with him. I carved out my own quiet space. But my goal in the eighth grade was to not be noticed. It was to fly under the radar. And then Matt was gone from school one day. And I still remember what it was like to stand there holding a tray and, and, and stare out at the sea of students all around and hope for just one of them to invite me over to their table. And it didn't happen. I dumped my tray of food in the trash can and then I hid in the boys restroom, which if you've ever been in an eighth grade boys restroom, you would know it's kind of a patch of the third world inside of a very first world school. I hated it. I had accomplished my goal of not being noticed and it hurt. And then I got invited to be part of something called the History A Club. Now, these two teachers, Mrs. Smoot and Mr. Darrow, they were amazing. And they saw me as more than a test score, more than a number. They saw me as someone who could be creative. They saw me as someone who cared about sports, who cared about um, baseball in particular, who loved history, who cared about social justice. And so they invited me to do this project and it was absolutely terrifying. The entire thing was straight up scary for me. I had to interview baseball players and I would script it out and I would call them and, and make phone calls and I, uh, you could hear the, the uh, sheet of paper shaking from my script. And then I was so glad every single time that I'd done it. I still remember a moment where I was recording my script at a radio studio and I listened to it for the first time and I hated it. And I told my teacher, Mrs. Smoot, I said, please do not make me play this in front of the class. And she said, no, you're going to have an amazing slide presentation and you're going to do this. And I said, no, I, I can't do it. I hate my voice. And she looked at me and she said, when you withhold your voice from the world, when you don't share your creativity, you are robbing the world of your creativity. And I won't let you get away with that. And that stuck with me forever. To this day, they became my heroes, Mrs. Smoot and Mr. Darrow. And in that phrase of not robbing the world of your creativity became one of my core beliefs. See, I believe to my core that schools should be bastions of creativity and wonder. It's what will prepare students for the creative economy. It's what prepares them for a creative life. And honestly, it's what increases student engagement. I, I don't think I ever had a better behaved class until I started actually incorporating creativity, which is very counterintuitive. It feels like if you let them make things and do things, it'll be messy and chaotic, and you always hear that. But what I found was the opposite, that when you empower them to be fully engaged with creativity, that the behavior problems go down. And yet we have these devices, these phones, and they can do everything that I had to physically do in person back in the day when I did the History Day project. 
I didn't realize it at the time, but I was using something called design thinking. And I'm going to get to that here in just a moment. But our devices can let you do all of these things. They're packed full of connective power and creative power. I physically had to take my, my pictures with a camera and then take the film to Walgreens and develop it when I was in eighth grade. Now I could just snap it with my phone. I had to make long distance phone calls to talk to baseball players. Now I could Skype with them. Our world is so much more creative and so much more connective. And yet I did a student survey to see how students use their devices. Do they consume or do they create? 158 out of 160 consume videos. Only four of them actually create something with it. 160, so all of them consumed audio, but only three of them had actually created and edited any audio with their devices. 153 of them had, uh, had, had played games on their phones, their tablets, or their computers, but none of them had actually coded and, and created their own game with something like Scratch. And the lesson for me was it's not about the digital divide. It's about the creative chasm. For all the talk of students being digital natives, they're actually consumer natives. So why is this the case? Well, this is our reality. Students are in this one-size-fits-all factory model. And they are passively consuming content. But here's the thing. Students aren't widgets. And although one-size-fits-all is great for socks, it is a lousy way to think about the mind. And you can complain about this, or you can advocate for solutions. And so for me, as a teacher, realizing that I wanted my students to be creative, that they needed it for the creative economy, that they needed it for the creative life, that it was a vital 21st century skill, I had to help them gain this maker mindset. And here's what I've realized. Number one, making is the mindset. That's the way you want students to approach things as creative thinkers, problem solvers, divergent thinkers, iterative thinkers. That is the mindset. The process that makes it happen is design thinking. And if you look at, at this right here, when students embrace design thinking, they become rebels and hackers, system th thinkers, explorers. They become uh, innovative and unabashedly and wildly different. They're, they're ready for the creative economy. They're, they're ready to take creative risks. They develop a growth mindset. They make connections between ideas. They learn to think divergently. They become problem solvers. They grow more empathetic. Those are the things that they become. And it's amazing. It doesn't work perfectly. Every project I've had has had flaws. There's been mistakes. There's been things that simply didn't work well. But it's totally worth it. It's something that works really, really well. And then launch is the framework. And we're going to get into that here in just a moment. So again, making is the mindset. Design thinking is the process and launch is the framework. Now, if you're interested at all, you could check out the book launch using design thinking to boost creativity and br bring out the maker in every student. AJ Giuliani and I both uh, developed this together. And, um, in the process, we had both, for, for over a decade, used design thinking as teachers. And we've realized that there were bits and pieces missing from the design thinking frameworks that already uh, existed out there. For example, uh, we wanted to add a, an inquiry and research phase because students really learn a lot from uh, engaging in research. And then the biggest thing is the launch. Um, going back to that History Day project, I didn't mention this in the story, but one of the proudest moments for me was when I actually finally launched my project to the world. And I had to share it with an audience, which was my peers at first. And I still remember I, I pressed play and, and then I did the slideshow. And when it was done, there was one of those like 1980s slow claps. And then it kind of went viral. And then everybody else started clapping. And it gave me such a boost in my confidence. It, it taught me that uh, not only was I a maker and a creative thinker, but that I needed to share my work with the world. It, it, it reinforced what Mrs. Smoot had told me when I was in the radio studio. 
And then I went to the district competition. I went to the state competition. And I eventually went to the national competition and had to present it in a giant arena. And it, and it was powerful to realize that, that my work, my creative work was being seen by an entire audience. And that's the power of the launch. That's the last piece. We're going to get into it here as we dive into the launch cycle. So first, I'm going to show you a video of what the launch cycle is. Design thinking is a flexible framework for getting the most out of the creative process. It is used in the arts, in engineering, in the corporate world, and in social and civic spaces. You can use it in every subject with every age group. It works when creating digital content or when building things with duct tape and cardboard. Although there are many models for design thinking, we have developed the student-friendly launch cycle. Here's how it works. In the first phase, students look listen and learn. The goal here is awareness. It might be a sense of wonder at a process or an awareness of a problem or a sense of empathy toward a group. Sparked by curiosity, students move to the second phase where they ask tons of questions. This leads to understanding the process or problem through an authentic research experience. They might conduct interviews or needs assessments, research articles, watch videos, or analyze data. Students apply the newly acquired knowledge to potential solutions. In this phase, they navigate ideas. Here they not only brainstorm, but they also analyze ideas, combine ideas, and generate a concept for what they will create. In the next phase, they create a prototype. It might be a digital work or a tangible product, a work of art, or something they engineer. It might even be an action or an event or a system. Next, they begin to highlight what's working and fix what's failing. The goal here is to view this revision process as an experiment full of iterations, where every mistake takes them closer and closer to success. Then, when it's done, it's ready to launch. In the launch phase, they send it to an authentic audience. They send their work to the world. And ultimately, that leads back to a place where they can look listen and learn. If you're interested in sparking creativity and boosting innovation in your classroom, join us for the Global Day of Design. You can get your free one day design challenge by clicking the link on this video. So take a day and test it out. See how your students respond to an engaging creative design challenge. So again, this is the launch cycle right here. And we're going to uh, begin with phase one, which is look, listen, and learn. In this phase, you're starting with a sense of awareness. And it might be something like a product idea, which is kind of the shark tank concept. It might be observing a natural phenomenon. This was the case when I was uh, uh, doing these really cool magnetic roller coasters in physics when I was in high school. And we started with the natural phenomenon, of just being amazed by magnets. And sometimes this curiosity leads to creativity. Sometimes it's awareness of an issue. And, and you can use design thinking for things like service learning projects. Sometimes it's a problem that needs to be solved and you simply start with a problem and then as you solve that problem you move into actually creating a solution that is a, a finished work, a finished product. And a lot of times um, some of the best products that have ever been invented started with that sense of a problem that needs to be solved. But sometimes it could be geeky interests. Uh, my students used to do geek out blogs and, and we would um, begin the school year with these geek out projects and they were design thinking projects and that would lead them to sort of geek out on whatever thing that they were most interested in, um, whether it was uh, skateboarding or fashion or foodie blogs. And, and it, it sort of was the, the beginning place for their Genius Hour projects. And you'll see this a lot. If you love Genius Hour, design thinking is an amazing framework for seeing uh, Genius Hour projects thrive. 
Sometimes you start with a sense of empathy. You really care about a group out there and that empathy draws you in. Well, that's going to move you into phase two, which is understand the, uh, sorry, that's going to move you into phase two, which is ask tons of questions. And in this phase, they're just engaging in as much inquiry as possible. They're asking whatever questions they want. They could be market-based questions. They could be questions about other products that exist. They could be cause and effect uh, um, problems uh, that they're interested in. Um, it could be uh, something about the, the physical environment. Um, it, it can be anything that, that, that taps into their own inquiry based upon what you first had in the look, listen, and learn phase. So that's L and A. You now move into U, which is understand the process or problem. And this is the idea of students as researchers. Now, if you teach younger kids, you might be wondering, how do I help them research if they're not good readers but I would encourage you to th rethink research uh, research could be interviewing people it could be doing long distance interviews it could be looking at pictures it could be doing little um, experiments all of those things are another form of research it could be watching videos or listening to podcasts and in, in my experience, kids are researchers before they are readers. Uh, if you look at a two-year-old, they're engaged in research, right? So something happens in school a lot of times where they actually lose that sense of knowing how to do research. And I think a lot of times they get scared or they start viewing research as just reading. And I've learned that it really requires you to take research off-road. It's about student ownership. And one of the things I love about design thinking, and you'll see this as you do this yourself, is, is students own everything. They own the L, the A, the U, the N, the C, and the H. They own the entire process. And that includes this research phase. But because it is structured, right? Because it is something that um, a, 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 a allows them to know boundaries and have systems and have scaffolding, they can own it, but it's not chaos. It's not anarchy. So the student choice actually boosts their creativity, but it doesn't get in the way of behavior, which was, was my biggest fear when I really started to refine this and develop this in my own classroom. And by the way, I taught middle school, and, and, and middle schoolers can be a little bit challenging. Um, but again, this provided that structure to allow the creativity to thrive. Uh, phase four is navigate ideas. This is when they're not only brainstorming, but they're turning the brainstorm around and actually creating a finished plan of what they're going to make. And so part one, again, is to brainstorm together. And then part two is to take that brainstorm and make an actual plan of action for what they're going to make. So they're taking all that research, all those questions, and now generating their own ideas and then from their ideas, they're going to move into a plan. And the following is the example of the brainstorming technique I use with students. Brainstorming can be fun. You get together and generate a massive list of ideas. Everyone is shouting all over each other. It's exciting. However, this often leads to groupthink where everyone remains fixated on one particular approach. Often quieter members never get a chance to share ideas and the group jumps to a potential solution way too quickly. Here's a different approach that I've tried in my classroom. It's not perfect and it takes a little bit longer, but it's something that worked for me so I thought I'd share it. First, students brainstorm alone. Some choose a list while others choose a web. Next, they meet together as a group. We have one rule in this phase, no judgment. This means no criticism and no commentary. The goal is to reduce fear. This part isn't timed. Sometimes we even brainstorm on multiple days and students borrow ideas from seemingly unrelated fields. Next, we have a member of another group join the brainstorm and add any fresh ideas that they hadn't considered. The original group then meets together yet again and they add ideas to the existing brainstorm while also combining similar ideas. Finally, they will analyze, evaluate, and narrow down their ideas until they have a single coherent concept. This process reduces groupthink while ensuring that everyone's voice is heard.
So after they've done the, the brainstorm, they move into a phase called find the parts. And this is the idea of the plan. I keep the plan very simple. We don't want to have them spending forever on it, but we do want them to know where they're going. Again, um, it, it might feel like they're restricting their creativity here, but this is actually boosting their creativity because it's, it's getting them to think and to be more intentional. So the first part is product idea. So they have a clear idea from that brainstorm, then their audience. And, and at this point, they really need to know who their audience is going to be. The next phase is the role. So are, do they know, um, you know, uh, who's going to do what in their group? Uh, if, if it's a partner or a, a small group, they really have a, a sense of the roles developed. And then the tasks and the tasks, I have them break it down into to, to, uh, to their own to do lists and then their own deadlines and, and this actually allows them to engage in their own progress monitoring and their own project management which is a really powerful transferable skill that they'll use outside of the classroom when i taught middle school they lobbied really hard to change it from uh, product idea to format idea so obviously it would be f-a-r-t-s but that didn't really fly so we kept it with parts after they've developed the plan, they move into cre uh, creating a prototype. And in this phase, they're actually making what they've done. And you might be wondering, you know, why did you have to go through four phases before you reach this part? You know, why can't they just start making stuff? And in my experience, you know, I actually did some research around this. Using design thinking led to a higher quality of work in the creative side. So all of those pieces were necessary. They were um, engaging in more divergent thinking. They were thinking outside the box more often, and, and they were actually more invested in the process. They, they cared more about the work that they were doing when they had gone through the L, A, U, and N phases. Sometimes their uh, product is a you know physical product, which was the case when we did things like our solar challenge. Sometimes it's art, which was the case of you know what we did when we painted murals or when we did our uh, social voice uh, blog. And sometimes it's an event or it's a, a community service activity, which is what happened when we used design thinking in our uh, service learning project. Now you might be wondering, you know, what if, what what if, what if I don't have the materials? You know, what if I don't have one-to-one -one devices? What if I don't have um, the greatest technology around? But often the best choice in technology is a roll of duct tape or some cardboard. You know, there's some amazing uh, design thinking products that are really low tech because it's not about the technology; it's about the thinking. It's about the creativity. Well, the next phase is highlight and fix. And this is where you're getting students to engage in revision. It's important to remember that every mistake is simply another iteration closer to success. And I love giving the example of a skate park. At a skate park, everyone's making mistakes. They're all engaged in revision, but they don't hate it. And part of it is that there's permission to fail. There's permission to make mistakes. and they grow into resilient people at the skate park, right? They develop that sense of grit. And that's what we're looking for in students as creative thinkers. We want them to develop that perseverance. And that's why it's really important that they have this phase where they're given the time and the opportunity to highlight and fix their work. The final phase is when it's ready to launch, and that's where they're launching their work to an authentic audience. It could be local, it could be global, it could be a small group, it could be whatever. And I, I found in my own classroom that um, you know we had some amazing uh, audiences that were very small, which was the, the case when um, my students developed these uh, gift baskets for their uh, the sweepers at our school, and and I'll still. Uh, remember this forever the, the moment when these sweepers got their gift baskets and they had never felt appreciated at our school and, and tears were streaming down their cheeks because my students had made something for them on the other hand when we filmed documentaries we had uh, the community our local you know citywide community was our audience um, there's an amazing example of, of, of an audience um, that watched a documentary in uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan. My fin friends uh, Trevor and Mike used design thinking and they did this World War II documentary and they had a red carpet event at a movie theater and, and it was powerful. Um, but it could also be, you know, online. 
and and that was the case when we we did our, our blogs um, it could be something smaller um, like you know local within the school um, there's a great uh, create a sport uh, project that we've done and the audience there is is you know their own school and 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 that works well as well you know the, the point is that they're defining the authenticity and I love giving this example of the lunar landing you know when we went to the moon um, we chose an audience it was one of the greatest moments of TV history and it was unscripted you know it was live and you know imagine if the astronauts had gone to the moon and they'd collected their findings and they'd published in a journal and 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 never shared their work with the world what would have happened on the other hand when students share their work with an authentic audience they experience what the astronauts did, which is they inspire other people. I mean, how many people who saw um, the lunar landing became inspired to be explorers and to push past the realm of human possibility? It didn't just inspire scientists. It inspired engineers, artists, writers to, to rethink what was possible, to, to think about the human potential. And that's what happens with students. Now, they might not get to go to the moon. I mean, let's be realistic. Kids aren't going to go to the moon. But when they share their work with the world, they inspire others. And I love that when this is happening, you as a teacher get to share this with your parents. And they get to see the amazing things happening in your classroom. And that's powerful. They get a, a new view of who you are as a teacher and what your students are capable of doing. See, when you launch to the world, you're saying, I'm not afraid to be known. Too often, though, student work just ends up on the refrigerator and, and that's it. It gets shared to a backpack and nothing more. But when they share to an authentic audience, what they're saying is, I'm not afraid to be known. And not only that, they inspire others. They grow more confident. It gives them this positive peer pressure where they do better work and they work harder because they actually care about it because it's authentic. It's also important that they share their journey. And we get into this in the launch cycle as well. Uh, Austin Kleon says, become a documentarian of what you do. And we saw this last year with the Global Day of Design. We had somewhere around 60,000 students sharing their work on Twitter, on Instagram, on uh, Facebook, on Snapchat. And it was powerful to watch their teachers documenting what they were doing with design thinking. And, and notice, these are very low-tech projects, right? As we look back and forth, but it doesn't matter because it's there and it's powerful and it's about the thinking. It's about that maker mindset that they get when they engage in design thinking. So I'm going to share a story that's kind of sad, but I think it's important to know it and to share it because it illustrates something powerful about design thinking. My students wanted to solve the graffiti problem in our school and in our community. And we'd painted over graffiti and then the graffiti just came back. The vandalism continued. And then students came up with a solution. We finally used design thinking. And their solution was to paint murals. They said, if we paint murals, the people doing graffiti won't touch it. And to our surprise, it worked. We painted eight murals in three years and not one of them got touched by vandals. These became a source of pride for our community. Mothers would stop by pushing their strollers and they would point to the murals and they would talk to their kids about someday you're going to be at that school. It was powerful. And then we got a new principal. And this principal thought that the murals looked unprofessional. So she had them painted over, painted them white, put up data charts instead. And I had a student who was really upset about it. He was actually crying about it. And he said, I'm never going to do creative stuff anymore. This isn't worth it. Why even bother? And I looked at him and I said, here's why. Because it's not about the work that you do. It's about your mindset. It's about you. It's about how different you are as a result. It's about the way you think about what you do. See, you now know that you are a maker and nobody can take that away from you. 
They can destroy your work. They can throw it away. They can paint it white. But they can't take away the change that's happened in your mind. And then I looked at him and I said, when you don't share your work with the world, when you refuse to share your creativity, when you silence your creative voice, you rob the world of your creativity. And I didn't know it at the time, but as I drove home, I remembered that that's exactly almost verbatim what Mrs. Smoot said to me when I was in the eighth grade. And it's a reminder that we as teachers have the power to turn our students into makers, to tap into something deeply human inside of them. And when that happens, nothing can take that away.